All right, it's uh, it's good to see everyone today. Um, and uh, our portion this week is Yitro, which uh, arguably could be the most important uh, Torah portion in the entire Torah. It could be the reason why, uh, in fact, we have the Torah. Uh, so, the, like I just said, the portion Yitro could be the reason why we have the, the entire Torah. It's, it's what everything that we've read uh, has led up to, and everything from Jewish history from this moment on is based on this moment. So the portion describes the people coming to Mount Sinai, uh, preparing to receive God's revelation or to experience God's revelation. Uh, that's a fancy word, revelation. That is God, they will be able to see God, to see and hear God. So God reveals God's self uh, through, uh, uh, by uh, the people being able to see and hear God. Okay, so in classic literature, uh, it's called the, the revelation of God at Mount Sinai. So everything from Genesis 1 until this portion, which begins on 432 in the Eitz Chaim, we're not going to start here reading from here, but it, it starts the 18th chapter of the book of Exodus. So everything from the 50 chapters of Genesis and the 17 chapters of uh, Exodus so far lead up to this point of getting to Mount Sinai and uh, experiencing God's revelation. So, and the, 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 um, the result of that revelation is the Ten Commandments. Some would say also that, God, that Moses, while on Mount Sinai, received the entire Torah because he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, as next week's portion, Mishpatim, points out. So the, the, the people hearing the Ten Commandments and Moses receiving the entire Torah is what the Torah is all about. So that's why I, I, could, I would argue, and many would argue, that this is uh, really the point around which the entire Torah revolves. Okay, now, um, let's, let's start on 436 instead of me uh, providing uh, more context. Uh, 436 is the fourth Aliyah, chapter 19 of Exodus. So whatever edition of Chumash you're using, look to Exodus 19, the portion Yitro, the beginning of the fourth Aliyah. Baruch Atadonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Sher Kitshanu, B'mitzvotav, Etzivanu, La'asok, Torah. Okay. Bachodesh Hashlishi, Litzait Bene Yisrael, Meeretz Mitzrayim, Bayom Hazeh, Ba'u Midbar Sinai. So, the translation is interesting based on the commentary below. A, 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 the literal translation is as follows In the third month, from the people of Israel leaving the land of Egypt. So not the third month of the year, but the third month since leaving Egypt. By Yom Hazeh on this day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so if we want to pinpoint what day exactly it is, it's kind of hard for us to understand because like I just translated, not looking at the English translation here in the Eitz Chaim, in the third month on this day. Well, which day in the third month? Okay, so that's why the English translation says on the third new moon after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt. And the commentary below suggests that the word chodesh, which in modern Hebrew means month, 
in biblical Hebrew also means moon. So in, in modern Hebrew, moon is yareach. But in biblical Hebrew, the word chodesh can mean moon and can mean month, which if you think about it, is really the same thing because the time it takes the moon to orbit the earth is essentially a month. Okay, it's 29 and a half days, right? Round up to 30 days. Most of the months are 30 days. Okay, so that's why moon, month sounds the same. So in, in biblical Hebrew, chodesh could be both. So then, okay, on the new moon, on the third new moon, after the people left Egypt, on, that, on this day, that is on the new moon, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Now here's the problem, because the Jewish holiday that's associated with this event and on which we read this section of the Torah is the holiday of Shavuot. And the date for the holiday of Shavuot is the sixth day of the month of Sivan. Okay? The sixth day of the month of Sivan as we count from Passover. So the second day of Passover, right, which is why it's in the Haggadah, a Haggadah that's meant for outside the land of Israel, right? In Israel, there's only one Seder, one Seder that's done on the first night of Passover. So on an, in an Israeli Haggadah, you will not find the counting of the Omer. In a Haggadah intended for use outside of Israel, you will find the counting of the Omer at the end of the Haggadah, after you've already opened the door for Elijah and sang Eliyahu Hanavi, and uh, right at that, after that is when we count the Omer. And if you look carefully in your Haggadah, it says for the second night of Passover. So at your second Seder, you do that. So that's day one. And the 50th day is Shavuot. The 50th day after Passover is the sixth day of the month of Sivan. Now, the order of the months is Nisan, Er, Sivan. Okay, so if Chodesh means month, then, okay, in the third month. So in Nisan, they have left during the month of Nisan, right? At the full moon, at the full moon in Nisan. So the 15th of Nisan, that night is when the, the, the 14th into the 15th is when they left. Okay, so it's the middle of the month. Then you have the month of Er. Then you have Sivan. So in the third month, if we translate this as on the third new moon, then it's not Sivan. Okay, because the the third the third new moon after leaving Egypt would mean right because they left at the full moon. So it's two more weeks until it's the next new moon. So if it's the third new moon, it would be the new moon of the month of Tammuz. So that would be, right, ER, first new moon, Sivan, second new moon, Tammuz, third new moon. So the, I, I bring all this up because you might be asking yourselves, who cares? The rabbis care because they've designated the date for this event, the revelation of God at Mount Sinai, for the sixth day of the month of Sivan. Because there are other things we're gonna be reading about soon, how many days the people have to prepare. Okay, so they arrived at the desert of Sinai on the new moon. Okay, well, all I'm saying is, that by reading it as the new moon, 
the English translation presents a problem that the rabbis solved in a different way by the rabbis reading Chodesh as month and not new moon. Okay, so just the, the rabbis, so what, the, what I mean by all of this is th that we observe Judaism and for a lot of the time we interpret the Torah based on how the rabbis suggested we needed to interpret the Torah, right? So there was big discussion in the Talmud page of the day a few days ago about how to understand eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and how to understand, that's a, a phrase in the Torah that we'll read about in next week's Torah portion, that somebody gouges out your eye, you're, uh, you're supposed to gouge out their eye as punishment. That's what it seems from straightforward reading of the text. The rabbis in the Dafyomi cycle found in the tractate Baba Kama, which we're in right now, just from last week or so, we're discussing, no, eye for an eye, as the Torah is teaching it, does not mean literally eye for an eye. It means monetary compensation. And they bend over backwards to prove from the Torah how eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as written in the text, is clearly understood as uh, monetary compensation. Okay, so that's just one example of many examples of how the rabbis interpret the Torah and we follow rabbinic interpretation. Okay, I would, I would say it's similar to, the, to, to Christianity understanding that Jesus was born on December 25th. The Christian Bible does not give a date for his birth. As far as I remember, from the once or twice that I read the Gospels, the church fathers determined that December 25th is the day that Jesus was born. Okay, so uh, the church fathers do the same thing that the rabbis do in taking the text and interpreting it in the way they think their, fo their followers need to understand it. Okay, so we just have to keep in mind that as we're reading the text literally, that um, the that the um, the that what we take away from it, not just in how we understand the text, but the holiday that is observed as a result of what's written in the text, is understood by how the rabbis interpret it. I'll, a further example related to this: How do we? reach 50 days uh, from the people leaving Egypt to getting to Mount Sinai. And how does it work then to connect? So first of all, how do we get this to be the sixth day of the month of Sivan? So again, understanding this as month, not new moon. So they're in the third month. And then understanding what we'll see uh, in a few verses from here that it's three days of preparation and then another three days until God spoke so that we understand then it was the sixth day of that month but how do we know that Shavuot then is 50 days after uh, after Passover that is from a convoluted reading of the book of Leviticus where it says how to count the Omer when to start counting the Omer the 50 days of Omer it says, Mimocharat ha Shabbat, Tispiru, Chamishim Yom. From the day after Shabbat of Passover, you should count 50 days. Well, there's a problem. If you count from the first Shabbat during Passover, and let's say Passover starts on a Monday, then Shavuot does not end up being on the sixth day of the month of Sivan, it will be later. And uh, so therefore, the rabbis had to understand in that context in Leviticus that Shabbat does not mean the day, the seventh day of the week. It means the first day of the holiday, which is Yom Tov, which is like Shabbat. 
you see the convolution that the rabbis do in order to make the 50 days always work. All right, so from the day after the first day of Passover, which in Leviticus is Shabbat, that's when you start counting 50 days. But the Ethiopian Jewish community, who did not have contact with the rabbis, but did have the Torah, read Shabbat as Shabbat. So they observed Shavuot always on a different day than the rest of the Jewish community observed Shavuot. Because they count, because Leviticus says the day after Shabbat during Passover, that's when you, so there are times that uh, the Jewish community and the Ethiopian Jewish communities Shavuot align, and that would be if the second Seder is Saturday night. And I think that that can happen. It happens every now and then like that, that the first Seder can be on a Friday night, second Seder can be on a Saturday night. If that happens, then the Ethiopian Jewish Shavuot and the other Jewish Shavuot would be the same day. Otherwise, it's a different day, okay? So uh, all of that, an extended discussion about how the rabbis understand, and that's just from the um, problem that our verse says, on, in the third month on this day. How, what day, how does that make sense? So Chodesh then, for the sentence to make sense, uh, on the third new moon on this day. So yes, the, the new moon itself is a day. So on this day, but that, that, that last thing I'll say about this, this also presents then the possibility of different strands of tradition coming together in this one story and how the editor didn't edit out the challenges presented when you merge these different traditions together. Okay, so you have this one tradition that it was on the new moon. You have this other tradition that it was on uh, the sixth day of the month or something else like that. So uh, when exactly did it happen? Okay, so there's also Midrash about this day. So the, the Midrash suggests that, um, that when we read the story, it's as if we are reliving the experience and that it is this day that God is revealing God's self to us at Mount Sinai. Okay, so usually it would say if you're the narrator would talk in the past tense right on that day is when all of this happened. Right, the narrator is usually in the Torah is not talking in the present tense. Usually the narrator talks in, this is what happened. So you would imagine that the Hebrew should have said Bayom Hahu on that day. But it says Bayom Hazeh, which means this day. So that's why the Midrash, one Midrash suggests a, a beautiful idea that the Mount Sinai experience wasn't just a historical event, the Mount Sinai experience is supposed to be an ongoing spiritual event and allows for converts to Judaism to feel that they're part of the Mount Sinai experience because as they convert to Judaism, that process of conversion and then the subsequent observance of Jewish tradition allows them and, and the study of Torah allows them to feel as if they were at Mount Sinai too, but it also allows for all Jews as we study Torah as we experience the holidays and observe the holidays as if it's this day that we're doing it and it's like we're there and it's not just it's like a time warp an eternal time warp that it's always happening right now okay um verse two midbar sinai Vayachanu Bamidbar, Vayichan Sham Israel, Neged Ahar. So they traveled from Refidim and they came to the wilderness of Sinai and they camped in the desert and Israel camped there opposite the mountain. Now, 
here's another interesting thing about the Hebrew that gets lost in the English translation. The way I translated it makes sense grammatically. But in Hebrew, when I said they camped in the wilderness, and then I said Israel camped there, the, the Israel camped there, the word camped is in the singular. The, they camped in the wilderness is in the plural. The Hebrew for camping, the first camping is in the plural. The second camping is in the singular. So that also prompts the, um, right? So Israel, Israel, it should be as a nation, should be in the plural. Vayachanu sham Yisrael. It should be vayachanu, like at the first vayachanu in the fourth line there in the Hebrew, but it's vayichan, the singular. So there's another midrash that the people were united in one heart and one spiritual being accepting the revelation of God at Mount Sinai. Okay, so the rabbis take advantage of that um, editorial mistake uh, with, ch with the singular by teaching that idea as well. Okay, so the bayomaze, ongoing revelation, every day is a new day, experiencing revelation, and all of Israel as one, as if they're one body, receiving the revelation too. Verse 3. Umoshe Allah El Ha Elohim Faikra Elav Adonai Min Hahar Lemor Ko Tamar Leveti Akov Vitaged Livne Yisrael. So Moses uh, went up to God and God called to him. Now, the two names, the two most important names of God are Elohim and Adonai, and both appear in this verse. So again, for the rabbis, Elohim and Adonai represent two important aspects of God, uh, the God of justice and the God of mercy. Elohim is the God of justice. Adonai, yod heh vav -Hey, is the God of mercy. So justice and mercy are calling out to Moses as he approaches God, uh, from the mountain saying, this is what you should say to the house of Jacob and what you should say to the people of Israel. Okay, so it's a poetic emphasis, just a straightforward reading of this. Why does the verse have to say two, way, two, two times to talk to the people of Israel? So the rabbis answer, oh, we understand from here that Beit Yaakov represents the women and B'nai Yisrael represents the men. That's why in uh, ultra-Orthodox communities, girls' schools are called Beis Yaakov schools. Okay, Beis, because of pronouncing the Hebrew in the old Ashkenazi way, if you look at the Hebrew on the second line there, the letter Tuf of the word Beit, for Beit Yaakov does not have a dot in it. And remember in the old Ashkenazi way of pronouncing Hebrew, the letter tough without a dot is pronounced as an S. So that would be Vais Yaakov. So Vais Yaakov, Vais Yaakov schools are girls' schools based on this right here. And then it maintains also this, I, this gender segregated idea that God only speaks to the men in the Torah, right? God is always addressing B'nai Yisrael, which I, I always translate as the people of Israel, but technically speaking in, um, in biblical Hebrew, well, in Hebrew, modern Hebrew too, Hebrew is a gender-based language. So traditionalists take that halachically seriously by saying that, Everything commanded in the Torah is mostly just commanded to the men. Okay, so as conservative Jews, um, we are egalitarian and understand the limitations of the gender based language. And so, therefore, it's not a problem for me to translate it as people and not men. And then to see Beit Yaakov and B'nai Israel is just as a further 
kind of poetic uh, emphasis, make sure everybody's there to, uh, to, hear, uh, to, to hear what you're going to say. Okay, verse four. Atem ri'item, asher asiti lemitzrayim, va'esa etchem al kanfei nasharim, va'avi etchem alai. You have seen what I did to Egypt, and I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. Okay, so going with the poetic theme here, yeah, it seems as if aside, there was also a battle with the Amalekites on the way. So it wasn't like an easy kind of journey. It was a seven week journey if we're basing Shavuot and this event on how the rabbis are counting it. Uh, this is a seven week journey that God is describing as if it, they were on eagle's wings to get to Mount Sinai. Okay, so uh, yes, the battle with the Amalekites, no Israelite uh, was killed in that battle because it was a miracle in that uh, Moses's arms had to be raised and stay raised by Joshua and Hur holding his arms up. And as long as his arms were raised, which they were all day, then the people of Israel were able to vanquish uh, and defeat the, uh, the Amalekites. So perhaps then the, the journey could be a miraculous journey as if God is transporting them on eagle's wings. Verse five, Ve'ata im shamoa tishmu bekoli ushmartem et briti v'yitem li segula mi kol ha'amim ki li kol ha'aretz. And now, if you were to listen to my voice and uh, follow, observe the, my covenant, we haven't had a covenant yet, it's about to be established, then you will be for me um, a, a, a special. Sugula says treasured possession. Yes, something special. You'll be different, unique from all the nations, unique in a good way, in a special way, a treasured way. That's what Sugula means. So uh, you, will, if you listen to my voice and follow the covenant, then you will be treasured to me uh, from all the nations because the whole earth is mine. Um, indeed, all the earth is mine, it says. Six, va'atem tiuli mamlechet kohanim vegoi kadosh eile hadvarim asher tedaber el b'nei Yisrael. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy people. These are the words that you should speak to the people of Israel. Just the people of Israel, B'nai Israel, not Beit Yaakov. So Beit Yaakov isn't repeated here. It's not repeated, I don't think, any place else in the Torah. Uh, it's always B'nai Israel. So, um, so all the people are going to be priests and a holy people. Okay, so that's, that's the ideal of coming as one people to Mount Sinai or the wilderness of Sinai here. Um, and Moses goes up the mountain and this is what he tells the people. Listen to God's voice, follow the covenant, then you will be a treasured people from among all people uh, on the earth. And you will be considered as a kingdom of priests and a holy people. Okay, so this is the ideal to which we are supposed to strive and how the, how the rest of the Torah and the entire Bible shows how the people failed at this spiritual mission, right? They, they just have to listen to God's voice. And if they do, then we would be a treasured people. So a, a spiritual perspective on Jewish history could be tragically understood 
as the failure, the glaring failure of living up to this ideal. Because we're, we're told later in the Torah, if you don't follow the covenant, then you're going to be punished. Right? So follow, here it's just in the positive. Follow God's voice, follow the covenant, you'll be special people set apart from all the other nations of the world. Right? The negative, if you don't do this, is, is taught a little bit later in the Torah a couple of times. So, which teaches the difficult lesson of, uh, uh, that can be learned from all of Jewish history, which is the, the tragedies of Jewish history because befall us uh, or befell us because we fail to live up to our, uh, our potential. And what, uh, not just the potential, what we're commanded to do. Okay, 438, the start of the fifth aliyah. Vayavo Moshe, Vayikra leziknei ha'am, Vayasem lifnehem et kol hadvarim ha'ele, asher tzivahu Adonai. So Moses came and called to the elders of the people, uh, of the nation, and he put before them, or placed before them, or talked before them all these words that God commanded him. So in other words, God spoke to the elders, and the elders shared this with the people. Verse 8, all the people responded together and they said everything that God has spoken we will do all that God has said is listen to my voice and, and follow my covenant so the people are saying yes we'll do that and Moses uh, uh, reported back these the the words these words of the people to god okay now there's an interesting commentary here that is not just based on this verse but also uh based on just a second where is it where they um the the word we're told that Uh, the people are camped at uh, the base of the mountain. Just a second, let me just, uh, there it is. And the end of verse 17. So we're, we just read verse 8, and I want us to look at verse 17 to understand this. Vayotse Moshe et ha'am likrata Elohim. So I'm on 440, verse 17. Min ha'machane ha'har. So Moses uh, brought out the people to uh, before God from the camp and they stood at the base of the mountain that's literally what that means so or the foot of the mountain it could also mean underneath the mountain it could in other words tahat harhar which would literally mean underneath the mountain so how could they be underneath the mountain so there's a midrash Okay, if we would now back to 438, below the line where it says number eight. One tradition describes, right, so when the people said everything that God said will do, one tradition describes God as compelled to lift the mountain over their heads, threatening to crush them with it unless they accept the Torah. So in other words, the Babylonian Talmud in Tractate Shabbat, based on why the people are willing to say everything God says will do, and based on verse 17, where it says they're at the foot of the mountain or under the mountain, the rabbis say, ah, well, let's understand it this way, that maybe this could, under, this could explain why the people of Israel are so lackadaisical about observing Jewish tradition and why the people have failed 
to uphold tradition from generation to generation. It's because they were forced into it. That mountain was literally over their head. God picked up the mountain and put it over their heads as if it's about to fall on them. So, whoa, 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 whatever we can do to make sure the mountain doesn't fall on us, we'll say, yeah, 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 sure. We'll do whatever God says, absolutely. And the next sentence would be anything so that the mountain doesn't fall on us. All right. So uh, once the mountain is put back where where it was and nobody was hurt, thank goodness. And now, thank goodness, not thank God, because they already forgot about God. Okay, so this this understanding from the Babylonian Talmud tries to explain the the lack of spiritual devotion of the people of Israel, of the Jewish community from generation to generation. So that's one idea, okay? But an, a more positive idea is another rabbinic tradition has Israel responding enthusiastically to God's demands. It sees the event as a wedding with the uplifted mountain serving as the marriage canopy. All right, so other rabbis don't deny the fact that the mountain was raised up, but it was raised up not as a threatening um, idea, right? I'm going to drop this mountain on you unless you say you're going to follow everything I'm telling you, but rather transforming the mountain into a chuppah so that the covenant that the Torah is becomes the ketubah, and the marriage is the marriage of the people of Israel and God. The God is the bride. The people of Israel are the groom. Uh, Moses is the Masader Kedushin, the one arranging the marriage. And the Torah is the Ketubah. The book of Song of Songs is kind of like this love poem understood by the rabbis as the, 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 the uh, extolling God and the Torah. So the, the um, graphic uh, R-rated imagery of the book of Song of Songs is, is not R-rated at all. You take the woman's body parts to understand the people of Israel and the Torah. Okay, so there's lots of themes within rabbinic literature of Mount Sinai being the wedding day of the Jewish people and God. So that's the positive nature of this mountain becoming the chuppah. And there's another positive thing, yet another, another rabbinic tradition pictures God offering the Torah to the other nations to forestall any charges of favoritism toward Israel, only to have them, the other nations, reject it when they learn of its demands, right? That's a classic midrash. It brings it to the Ishmaelites what does the, Ishma, uh, the Ishmaelites say? What's in the Torah? And God says, do not steal. Um, and the Ishmaelites said, well, that's our livelihood. We can't take that. And to another nation, uh, do not uh, covet or, or do not murder. Well, we make our livelihood of going to war and whatever. That's who we are. Well, we can't, we can't, we don't want any part of it. Right? So lots of things that are in the Ten Commandments to other nations who say, we can't do it because we do this. Um, and so then Israel is like the last resort. Sure, we'll take it. Uh, whatever's written in the Torah, we'll, do, we'll say. We'll, we, we will do. Call us here, Diber Adonai, Nasa. So, so this, this statement in verse 8 becomes the acceptance of the Torah after it was offered to other people. All right, so there's one negative idea that from the rabbis to, of this under the mountain that uh, to, to highlight why the people of Israel have been punished so, and the, 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 nature, the human nature, the Jewish nature of uh, rejecting God uh, throughout history, or the others in which is, 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 is saying good things about the people of Israel. So, there, so you have some rabbis who are willing to speak ill, of uh, of their fellow Jews and other rabbis who are giving their fellow Jews the benefit of the doubt. Okay, so um, right. So the, the commentary goes on. The divergence 
of traditional views, right, negative, positive, may reflect an ambivalence toward the Torah's demands or the reality of their experiences later in history. The varying midrashim may reflect the truth that the mitzvot are both a joy and a burden. The prophets Hosea and Jeremiah look back on the wilderness years as a honeymoon period. Uh, right, we sing this. The choir sings this, the, the traditional tune, Zacharti la chesed ne'uraich. It's part of the Rosh Hashanah Musaf, uh, Musaf service. I remember uh, the, the love uh, and the compassion I had for you, the love you had for me in your youth. So that, that, that verse from Jeremiah that's in the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah here. So the prophets Hosea and Jeremiah look back on the wilderness years as a honeymoon period, the golden age when Israel was close to God and trusted God. You know, it's not really so. Uh, they see the Mount Sinai experience as that. But you know what happens two portions from now is the golden calf. So that while they are waiting for Moses to come down the mountain, so in just 40 days after, after this uh, 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 unbelievable, awesome experience, they already sin with the golden calf. And then that's not the only sin. They also don't listen to, to uh, the spies uh, who come back. Well, they do listen to the spies and lose faith in their mission about or their the impending um, entrance to the to the land of Israel that all is going to be lost right so and they say what well, we should have just stayed in Egypt so it all wasn't great but this Mount Sinai experience right here the idea that they all heard God that the prophets hark back to because there is this is the only time in the entire Bible where the entire community of Israel heard God's voice and there must have been something special about them and that generation that is different from every other generation because no other generation of Israelites or Jews as an entire community of Jews have heard all at once God speak to them. So there's got to be something special about the people then. Um, the Torah's own, own account, the commentary ends is in subsequent chapters, shows Israel as repeatedly rebellious and complaining. Okay, so um, verse 8. So we read that. Verse 9. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe, hine anochi ba elacha ba'av he'anan, ba'avur yishma ha'am bedabri imach, ve'gam b'cha ya'aminu le'olam, Moshe et Ha'am el Adonai. So I'm going to translate it this way. God said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud so that the people can hear me when I speak to them, when I speak to you, can hear me when I speak to you, and that they will also follow you or be loyal to you forever. In other words, I'm going to speak from this cloud to you. Everybody's, everybody's going to hear that. And by them hearing that, they're going to he know that I, God, has spoken and that you, Moses, are to be listened to and to be followed as the leader of the people. So the purpose of the revelation is not just to teach Torah, but also to ensure um, on, on, uh, uh eternal loyalty to Moses as the as the leader of the people because he merited God speaking directly to him and and Moses told the the words of the people to God in other words the words being that everything that God will do uh everything God will say we will do 10 vayomer adonai el moshe lech el ha'am God says to Moses, go to the people, uh, make them holy today, or they should sanctify themselves today and tomorrow, and they should wash their garments. 11. 
Layom Hashlishi, they should be ready for the third day. Ki Bayom Hashlishi, Ye Raid Adonai Le'ene Kolaam Al Har Sinai. And they should be ready for the third day because on the third day, God will descend uh, in, in front of the eyes of the people on Mount Sinai. So here's a problem. It's the third day that God is coming down to speak. What about the sixth day? Where, where are there six days here from the beginning of the month of Sivan to, uh, to the revelation of Mount Sinai? So, it's, so the, the rabbis have some work to do that perhaps God and Moses and the people were getting there for three days. And then there is three days of preparation, this washing of the clothes and sanctifying themselves, and that adds up to six days. So there are different ways that the rabbis are looking at how the three days become six days in the month of Siva. Um, okay, so it's, um, it's just after a quarter to 12. Um, all right, I didn't get to everything that I wanted to get to today, but um, anyway, um, any thoughts or questions that we didn't get to ask? Yeah, Bob. Well, I admit I am far from a Torah scholar, probably. Yeah. Okay. But this is the first time I heard basically, and pardon the term, but the, the Israelites are like blackmailed. I'm going to throw a mountain on you unless you accept the Torah. I've never heard that interpretation before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that is uh, exactly. Am I the only one? I, I'm, I'm sure you're not the only one. But um, yeah, this is something that is taught, though, in a Jewish day school. So I remember learning that Midrash about standing under the mountain a long time ago. It wasn't something I learned in rabbinical school. So it depends on the Jewish education that we have. And that, yeah, that's a classic story, but it goes to, um, you know, to just the, 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 the dilemma the rabbis had to try to make sense of why is it that in the face of all these wonders that God did for the people of Israel, that the people of Israel are quick to neglect God, right? They, they leave Egypt. So it's one thing to get to the body of water and you're a ragtag group of slaves. It's the middle of the night. You get to the body of water. Now what? Okay, we were just, uh, yes, we had all these plagues. Awesome. But now what? So you can understand that. But they cross the sea and they start going and they complain about being thirsty. Okay, that you can't really understand that God has now just done everything for you. God has saved your life. And now you're thirsty. Okay, and you're hungry. So God provides this uh, bitter water makes it sweet. And God determines that manna is going to fall every day now for the rest of the time until they get to Israel. Okay, so it's all set and an enemy nation comes. Don't worry, Moses, just lift your hands. You'll defeat them, no problem. Defeated the Amalekites, no problem. Walk here to Mount Sinai. Wow, we just heard God's voice. It wasn't just Moses telling us that God spoke. It wasn't just seeing all these, these things happening around us. We actually hear God's voice ourselves. 40 days later, where's Moses? Aaron, make a golden calf for us. So the rabbis are trying to make sense of that. How could, if that generation that actually had miracles done by God for them and they couldn't believe in God, how much more so in our generation when we haven't heard God at all and all of this is just history, how much more so why we aren't believing in God and how difficult it is to inspire people to believe in God. So the rabbis recognize they have a difficult task before them in convincing people to believe in God and even more so today in 2024 how difficult it is right there was just something on NPR the other day a Pew research study about the religious tendency of um, American people they've also done separate study just on the Jewish community the nuns n-o-n-e-s 
uh, th this is a category of people who are atheists, agnostic, or just don't believe in God for whatever reason, uh, or, or they're, not, they're not believers right now, is the highest it has ever been. It's nearly a quarter of the American population. So that means it's a lot, so if you understand that Jewish trends are similar to general society American trends, uh, the, the job of the rabbi is getting harder and harder to convince people, right? It's a people of the generation of the, you, the people who are watching right now on this Zoom call, uh, the nuns among your generation is minuscule. It's of the, the younger the population gets, the larger the nuns is. Okay, and that's that's the problem for the future of the Jewish community, or the future of the non-Orthodox Jewish community today. All right. And uh, do we need a Mount Sinai to be hovering over our heads in order to get us to go to shul and get us to keep kosher and keep Shabbos and do all other Jewish things? I don't. That's not the way that I would prefer to see people be Jewish. But that's that's an interesting midrash that the rabbis rabbis are coming up with. Okay, we'll stop here for today. Have a good rest of the day, everybody, and um, hope everybody uh, stays well. And we continue to pray for peace in Israel. Amen. Yashikol. Thank you. Thank you.